Studies at Georgetown, along with Cecilia Gonzalez, uh, Gonzalez Andreu, Professor of Theology at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. Their conversation will be moderated by Vincent Cunningham, who's a staff writer and theater critic for The New Yorker. In 2020, he was a finalist for a National Magazine Award for his profile of the comedian Tracy Morgan. His writing on books, art, and culture has appeared in The Times Magazine, The Times Book Review, The Vulture, The All, The Fader, and McSweeney's, not to mention Commonweal. And in just a moment, Vincent will introduce you to our panelists. Um, but first, I want to remind everybody that our next and final session will be held a week from today, Thursday, June 24th, at the same time, when the topic will be metanoia. Uh, if you've registered for this event, it means you've registered for the next one as well. I also want to let everyone know now that all of the conversations in this series will be available for later viewing on YouTube if you'd like to watch again or you're not able to attend live. Uh, just a few more items of housekeeping. As part of the webinar settings, your video and microphone are turned off. The chat is disabled, so please direct all questions to the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you have a technical question, you can send it through the Q&A and Commonweal staff monitoring the Q&A will be able to answer your questions. I also would like to offer this reminder about our Common Wheel events. They are free and open to the public, and they wouldn't be possible without our readers and subscribers. The support and encouragement we get from friends and readers of Common Wheel are indispensable. If our independent lay run voice matters to you, we invite you to support us with a tax deductible donation. Just see the donate link in the chat feature or go to our website. You can also continue to be part of the conversation by subscribing to the magazine signing up for our newsletters, listening to our podcast, and following us on social media. Your help is a big part of everything we do. I also have to thank the folks at Commonweal who've put this series of events together, especially our audience development team, Milton Javier Bravo, Gabriella Wilkie, Adriana Melnick, along with our publisher, Tom Baker. And finally, let me thank those who've agreed to take part today, our moderator and our panelists, and all of you for joining us. So now, without further ado, I'll hand things over to Vincent Cunningham. Thank you so much, Dominic. And it's such a pleasure to be here with you. Thanks to you and to Commonweal for giving us this opportunity. And I'm really excited to, to get talking today. But before I do that, I'd love to just uh, introduce our panelists. Um, Cecilia Gonzalez Andreu is a professor of theology at Loyola Marymount University, where she also works on multiple initiatives to serve the Latinx community, especially undocumented students. A graduate of LMU and the Graduate Theological Union through the Consortium of the Jesuit School of Theology in Berkeley and the University of California, Berkeley, she's a contributing writer for America, uh, America Magazine and publishes widely as a public theologian. She's a member of the board of directors of the Ignatian Solidarity Network. A respected international lecturer on issues of political theology, theological aesthetics, and Latino theology, she is the author of the book, Bridge to Wonder, Art as a Gospel of Beauty, co-editor of Teaching Global Theologies, Power and Praxis, and a contributor to many other publications, including Going to the Streets, The Welcoming Church of Pope Francis. Um, it's wonderful to be here with you, Cecilia. Marsha Chatlin is a professor of history and African-American studies at Georgetown University. Following the police shooting of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, she organized a social media response in the form of the crowdsourced hashtag Ferguson syllabus. She is also the author of Southside Girls, Growing Up in the Great Migration, and as Dominic mentioned, the newly Pulitzer winning uh, book franchise, The Golden Arches in Black America. It's wonderful to be here with you too, Marsha. Um, and so I'm really excited to be with both of you. Um, and I can't wait to get into this topic, which is a, a site of some sort of internal struggle for me, the, the issue of righteous anger. And I can't wait to maybe clarify some, some things about it uh, together today. Um, so first it might be good to just set up some description, what, what we've seen over these past, call it 16, 18 months. I keep saying year, but it's longer than that now. Um, what kinds of anger over this period of sort of pandemic and so and public health crisis and economic crisis and um, um, also uprising in America's streets uh, about the issue of police brutality. 
Um, all of that swirling around of it, swirling around us. What kinds of anger, righteous or otherwise, um, have you seen around you or observed in yourselves um, through your work and in other settings? What what have you been seeing in terms of anger? How has it manifested in your minds? I'll jump in. Um, you know, I, I I was really um, pleased and I'm excited to be part of this conversation with Commonweal. Um, that we were willing to take anger seriously. Because I think that there is a way that many communities, but particularly faith communities, can use, um, can, can create a false dichotomy in which faith is supposed to be um, the salve for anger at the risk of not really engaging the productive value of anger. And I wanna take your question in a different direction because we've seen um, anger at state structures and state failure. We've seen anger um, that has mixed with grief in a lot of the protests around police violence. We've seen incredible um, moments in which um, people are angry because they believe that things can't change. But I think right now, um, for the purposes of this conversation, it makes me think of the displaced anger that is animating and fueling the racism, the xenophobia, um, the ethnocentrism, the Islamophobia, the, you know, the um, gender-based violence that we see in our society in which anger about um, the failures of um, a society that is supposed to cater to you, anger at the possibility that you're held accountability, you're held accountable for your behavior, anger about um, being um, held to kind of um, a standard of humanity has, been, I think, a chronic problem that we also have been living with, but the types of anger that we identify, right, is the things that we see when people are rising up against racist structures. So there's this really interesting way where there are entire communities that are, you know, tying themselves up in knots over, you know, the teaching of critical race theory, all of these like straw people that are put out into the public square. This is a form of displaced anger, but I don't think it's identified as such. And so when we think about the problem of anger, it's the problem of people who are marginalized who are trying to kind of push um, the question of how society will actually respond to their own humanity. So I want us to keep that in mind that there's, there's lots of types of anger that we've seen over the past you know, 15 to 17 months as, as you mentioned. Yeah, uh, for my comunidad, I think the, the level of stress and anger has, is, you know, the last five and a half, six years. Um, I mean, I think the anger is that I have felt myself to a point where I just prayerfully needed to figure out what to do was when I was uh, back in August of 2019, I went with a, a bunch of uh, comunidad uh, to, and these were faith communities and we went to pray and protest at the Adelanto Detention Center in the desert here. And there was, there must have been about 200 of us praying, sharing the stories, kids telling the stories of their parents who had been detained. And um, across the street, there was five protesters who all looked like what we saw later at in the January 6th uh, insurrection, uh, and they were they were on the side where the um, the the prison is, and we were across the street, and they all had megaphones and were screaming out obscenities and telling us all to go back and get out of here, and uh, and here we were, you know, children elderly people all praying together for those who were suffering inside. And I don't think I've ever felt so much what it must have felt to be one of the Hebrew prophets, because I just wanted to call God's judgment on them. And that was all I could do. I, you know, I, I had to raise my hands and ask for God's judgment on this situation, because I felt so powerless against these people and their hatred. Uh, and at the same time, I knew I could not become one of them. 
And, and as I looked around and I talked to the members of my community, right, I saw, I didn't see people fighting back or screaming back. I saw people holding each other, caring for each other, praying with each other, forming solidarity with each other. And I thought that was the most powerful protest that we could make. So in my own community, as I listen, especially to my undocumented folks, um, anger is, is, is not something that we're ever supposed to express. Uh, it is not Christian and it is very unseemly in a, in a Latino cultural setting. So, so we had to come up with, with different uh, ways to deal with this. And, and, and I think those can be actually spiritually super fruitful for everyone uh, to think about how we do that. It, it's so interesting. I mean, both of you bring up this issue of different kinds of, like these countervailing forces of anger. I'm actually visiting DC this weekend and I was, you know, walking out on the National Mall today and thinking about January 6th, as you mentioned, and how that in some way serves as this icon of a different kind of anger, the, something that is totally entitled and something that has nothing to do with, you know, our, our topic here is righteous anger, right? It doesn't correspond with that of qualification, I guess, of the, the, the word anger. Um, I'm wondering if, and you mentioned a little bit of this, Cecilia, that you know, in, in some of our communities, we don't have a forum for anger, right? But I wonder if you found places, whether they're church communities, whether they're um, communities of protest or communities of solidarity in some other sense, that have helped um, in some ways discern which side of this line our anger falls on. It seems like we have a lot of, um, in the, certainly in Catholic social teaching, certainly in some of our sort of catechesis as children, we've all learned about the primacy of conscience and in some ways discernment. And it, it seems like that this would be well applied to anger. How do we know if our anger is this other, this thing that terrifies many of us, or if it is indeed righteous? Do we have resources to figure that out? in our communities or otherwise? I think that's, a, I think that's such a powerful question because um, it, 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 it gets the heart of whether we believe right, anger, even righteous anger is productive anger or productive right. or um, obstructive. And there's many ways to think about this because I think that um, our internal experiences of anger, depending on who we are, back to um, Cecilia's earlier points about communities, can be um, can be a source of drawing people closer to us to attend to that anger, or it can be our undoing. And so I think that um, you know when we think about spaces in which our righteous anger can be cultivated, can be um, molded into um, a, a kind of righteous commitment, one would hope that faith communities are one of many places in which that can happen. I don't know. You know, honestly, um, I, I just don't know if that's actually happening, um, particularly as it, um, as it relates to the formation of Catholic communities. Um, some, not all, and probably not most. And so I think that um, the, the second part of your question about, you know, like, what do we have, you know, what's the test? And I guess the test is, if righteous anger comes from a place in which um, people are concerned about abuses of power and the misuses of power, then either um, your own kind of reformulation of power can mediate some of this, or as we've seen in a lot of instances, what happens when those um, who were once in a powerless position, once they acquire a form of power, what do they do with it? Do they see it as something to, um, you know, to relinquish? or do they then start to kind of mirror and abuse it as well? And I think we have good examples of, of the latter and not the former. And so I'm always kind of um, challenged by this idea of what are the mechanisms socially that we are introduced to as children and through our own process of adulthood and into discernment, what do we learn that anger is? And I think most of the time we need we learn that it's a horrible, hateful thing, even when it comes from a place um, of a desire for justice. 
And so I think the reconfiguration of what anger, um, how anger is introduced as a set of emotions for us developmentally is the first step in kind of rethinking um, the uses of anger. Yeah, no, that's super helpful, Marcia. And I, I, I think there's, there's two things that I wanna think about here. The first one is that we need to be cognizant of the communities that cannot express anger publicly because it puts their lives in danger. Um, and, and that is one thing, again, when I'm thinking about uh, immigrant justice uh, that really calls out <laughs> to God for everyone else to be in solidarity because if you, you know, if you want to practice civil disobedience, you've got to be ready to be arrested. You can't be an undocumented student. You can't. And so uh, there's a lot of us who cannot be upfront about this. And so I, I really, you know, I would want a spiritual practice for the rest of us who can to say, who needs me? to be up front and take the brunt of this um, because they can't. So that, that would be number one. Number two is that in my own comunidad, as I said, you know, the idea of, of ira, of anger, it, it is, it's very unseemly and, and, and wrong. However, <laughs> we have developed a whole other way to talk about what, what we do. And this actually goes back to the amazing work of, of the theologian Ada Maria Isasi Diaz in the 1990s. She said, an ethicist. And she said, talking to women, I would ask them, how are you? Como estas? And they would invariably answer, in la lucha, in the struggle. And la lucha, the struggle is, is the thing that our community has cohered around to be able to talk about and discern, right, what is necessary for us. And, 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 and because La Lucha takes in paying the rent, protecting your undocumented friends, uh, and protesting in front of uh, City Hall, it takes all of that in. La Lucha is, is very holistic. Uh, and it really has been the way that we've answered each other for the last five years, como estas in La Lucha. Um, because that, that, that struggle, that continued, continued struggle is the thing. Now, the, the danger there, right, is that we can slip very quickly into grief and into can't do this anymore. La lucha is just too hard. It's too difficult. And here I, I'm gonna uh, shout out to my young undergraduate students who back years ago, when we were that close to getting the DREAM Act passed, and then it got, uh, it got stopped in the Senate, they, renamed their student group, which up until then had become, uh, was called IDEAS, uh, because UCLA's group was called that. They renamed themselves and renamed themselves Resilience. And they realized that La Lucha was going to need resilience. And, and so that's where we get this concept of Si Se Puede, which is so central to, and, and goes back to Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez, right? Discerning both La Lucha needs us and then we can re be resilient enough to stick with it, to stick with it. And, and Si Se Puede is a really powerful idea because it, it's not a, uh, yes, we can sounds like it, it may be the, you know, the translation, but it isn't because there's, there's no us in Si Se Puede, it's cosmic. It's, 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 there is a force in the universe which says, this is possible. This is possible. You have the power to make this possible. And so 
the si se puede really is an appeal, right? To, to God being for us uh, and being with us and walking with us. And so la lucha can then continue. So these two things need to be united. La lucha and the resilience of si se puede for us to, to not slip into paralysis of, of exhaustion. I mean, this brings up for me, um, and I don't know if Marcia, you had a direct response to, to, to this idea about the being in the fight, la lucha, or, but it does remind me of just kind of the larger category of usually when we talk about anger expressed civically, what we're talking about on some level is protest, is um, movements, right? And I know that you, um, as, as I mentioned earlier when I was introducing you, that um, you, created this crowdsource syllabus in the in the wake of, of, of Ferguson, Missouri. Was that, was that, did that seem to, to you to be sort of a manifestation of a similar impulse that, um, and I guess one way to think about it is that anger is often thought of as an individual emotion, but there is just like, you know, just like Pope Francis always talking about moving away from individualism to collective ideas that we are, can't even be saved in fact, on our own, it seems to me there's a similar trajectory with anger that like um, one way to decide whether anger can be uh, indeed righteous is to, to see whether it can be uh, expressed on behalf of the collective, not just on behalf of the self. Yeah, and I think that there's something also really important to think about um, the, the joy of shared anger, that there is something kind of um, both like existentially, um, liberating and freeing of seeing other people angry with you about the same thing at the same time. And I think, again, this is something we have to be very cautious of because angry groups of people have caused a great deal of harm and have intimidated and hurt people. But I do think that there's something to be said about the possibilities of one's individual anger becoming collective anger and giving birth to ideas. And so for me, as someone who has relationships that I believe operate on many frequencies, it is a relationships in which the anger I feel can be acknowledged and shared that I think are the most powerful ones, whether they are about a personal affront or whether they're about a kind of larger social and structural struggle. And so again, these are the types of things that um, we have to be really unafraid to amplify and really kind of get to the root of because I think that, again, when we frame protests and struggle um, as a, either as only reactive or only righteous, we forget that anger can actually fuel. I don't know if it can sustain, but it can fuel. And so all of this is to say is that, you know, when we have um, experiences of collective anger, the, the challenge is the collective action. And this is where leadership and this is where faith and this is where solidarity become really important because you can mobilize lots of angry people to do things, but um, you have to, at some point, um, allow for something other than anger to sustain whatever efforts you're trying to make. And so I think that um, as someone who studies, you know, um, social movements and had varying level of success, you know, from our kind of historical standpoint, um, movements that thrive are movements that center love and understand that anger and love are not necessarily incompatible. Yeah, I mean, that's, it's so interesting that you say that because I think about um, all of the scriptural injunctions to be slow to anger, right? That like God is slow to anger and all these things that, and we ought to be as well. If you, Proverbs, it's all about avoid anger because anger can lead to sin, right? But, the, but there are also, of course, instances of, um, you think about Job, you think about the wrath of the Hebrew prophets, as you mentioned, Cecilia, you think about God's anger in, when confronted with, with sin. Think about Christ in the, in the, in the temple, the, the, uh, the, mo the money lenders. But um, it's hard, it is hard to conceive of anger as being in sort of correlation with this ethic that we call love, which is like, you know, self emptying and always mindful of the other. And I guess that would be the way to think about it, right? If, you're, if your love can be 
used in the service of those qualities. It's, it's, I wonder, Cecilia, but how, I'm really interested in this idea that you mentioned of sort of being in, a, it's, it's being in La Lucha, being, it's sort of like as a process, right? That there's, that it's, it is because it is conducted among a people that understand themselves as a community, this fight can be refined and, and in some ways put toward loving purposes. Is that, how does, how does that, how does it move together through time, this, this concept? Well, you know, to be honest, I, I felt very incapable of addressing this subject myself with, with the kind of wisdom that we need. And, and so I started rereading the homilies of uh, Archbishop Oscar Romero, because I could not imagine how he homily after homily at funerals of murdered people uh, was able to bring together these two things, right? Um, the 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 nonviolence that he kept preaching and acting upon, uh, non you know unsparingly always talking nonviolence, and at the same time his his real profound anger at what was happening in El Salvador, and 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 what I found in him, and and I also find uh, in the writings of Saint Teresa of Avila, who's one of of my mentors as a, as a theologian, is the, this idea that the anger that we're feeling is God's. In other words, we have to discern God's will. What does God want for humanity? What does God want for our planet? What is God's desire? And when God's desire is subverted, when God's desires, God's will is, 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 you know, fought against, destroyed, then, right, that's the source of our anger, and that's the source of our power, um, because both Archbishop Romero and Teresa of Avila are very clear that it's God acting through us, God needs us to act, but it is God's it's not ours, right? So, so the, the, the space of prayer and discernment and community, right? In saying, okay, what should we do here? Uh, what does God ask of us here? It, it's really important. And, and for both of them too, you know, the, the, the sense, and you, you mentioned uh, self-emptying, right? And chaotic and our tradition of humility, for them, that's really central, right? For Romero and for Teresa of Avila. And what they do with that is they say, you can be profoundly self-emptying and humble because it's God. <laughs> it's God who's working through you. And, and Teresa of Avila is hilarious. She even says, you know, I'm so mad that even the demons fear me uh, when, when she's confronting power that it is painful and wrong and hurting her community, right? So I think that's, that's the point. We, we need to get to a discernment of God's will. And then if God's will is subverted, then we act out God's anger, which is what the prophets were doing. That's, um, that's wonderful. And, you know, maybe that's a good time to turn to some of the um, audience questions, which are sort of filing in and I would love to for people to ask more and we can go through some of those but it seems to me that um, this issue of um, a kind of kenosis and this 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 idea of God's will being a part of um, part of our discernment of where our anger is righteous um, a couple of people have asked about um, nonviolence specifically that um, you know, consider the nonviolence of, of, of Christ um, during his 40 days in the desert, considering, of course, the, the great sort of American themes that are sort of culminated in the uh, civil rights movement. Um, and that in some ways, the formula being this person says, um, through nonviolence, sort of it turned the anger into fruit bearing love, right? That this was one of a, a, a vector of refinement in some sense of that anger into a kind of love. Um, but of course, you know, this was 
also used for me as a bit of a trope last year when we were talking about protests and uh, whether it was iconoclasm, this was a big thing in the church, people uh, defiling statues of people in, that are regarded highly by the church, in some cases saints, or um, property destruction, other things. Um, this idea of nonviolence, in, in some ways, in, from my view, got used to sort of uh, try to downplay the power of the, those uh, uprisings. So I think nonviolence has an interesting place in all of this when we talk about the righteousness of anger. Um, has that been a part of either your, your thinking on this? This is kind of where I live when I, um, yeah. I see the kind of um, evocation of King as a kind of, um, you know, foil to, you know, King wouldn't want this to happen, King wouldn't right. want this to happen. Um, and we know that, that that rehearsing of the idea of what King's life must have been like or what his relationship to anger must have been like is it really reflective of what King has said himself about what his life you know, on earth was like? So all of that aside, I think that this is a really interesting interpretation um, to say that nonviolent movements uh, don't have room for anger, or perhaps that people who uh, practice and um, uh, embrace nonviolence necessarily um, expel anger from their, their, their consciousness because we, we know that there are people who, um, who, who very much participated in nonviolent movements, but the anger they felt due to their own victimization is something that imperiled them throughout their lives, regardless of the meaning of the movements and, and regardless of their commitment to nonviolence. So I think we have to be really careful about that. But I think what, what is being said um, in those moments, especially this past summer and past moments of uprising is not um, you're kind of out of order or you're out of compliance with the idea of nonviolence, but please no longer allow, please no longer show your anger because it puts me into a place of anxiety, fear, guilt, shame, and embarrassment. That what we really have in a lot of our social discourse is a deep desire to manage the anger of others for the benefit of the individual. And these are, this is why we have conversations about reparations for slavery devolve into, can't this be the end of it, right? So one of the ways that, um, the reason why anger is so terrifying is we fear that it will never end. This is why grief is so terrifying, right? This is why negative emotions are so terrifying because I think that regardless of, you know, our deep faith or our commitment or our discernment, we have a deep desire to control the anger of others in order to kind of release ourselves from what that what other people's anger does to us, what it does to our own anger. And so I think that that discourse is um, at best disingenuous, but at worst, it is a, is a, it is a form of, of control. It's a form of not recognizing the fullness of people. And it can be kind of couched in this, like, you know, what would King do uh, framework uh, that derails the importance of anger for our own, um, our own self-examination. Yeah, uh, and since for us that the concept of anger isn't really a developed one, but the concept of, of violencia is, right, of violence, uh, because la lucha it, it is, is something that is fueled, right, by the sense of the wrongness of things. Uh, and and the in lack of justice of things, um, but when we get to violence, right? Um, again, Oscar Romero was very clear. Violence was the um, the way of the cowardly, and he he over and over said, if you want, if you have a problem with me. If you have a problem with what I'm saying about the poor, and if you if I have said something wrong, then come talk to me. He would say, come tell me what I am doing wrong, and I will have a conversation with you. But that's the way we get someplace, he said. But if you are just going to use violence against the community, then it he had to resist that in every possible way and 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 be very clear calling the community out in mass right 
um, to show that the violence that was vis being visited upon the community was to silence them and to not allow for the kind of debate that he saw as necessary. The other thing is the labeling, right? We have spent the last five years of labels being hurled at people. Um, and he over and over says, why are we being uh, maligned and called Marxist when we're talking about the gospel, right? And he, he could see, right, that all of these labels were being used to, again, stop any kind of meaningful change, right? So I'm, I'm all for, there's things in, in our society, there's, there's images, <laughs> there's statues, there's things that have to disappear. They have to disappear. And I want us to disappear them, but I also want us to know why they have to disappear. And, and that's the part that takes more work, right? The, the kind of education that has to happen with a community where we don't just talk about, well, this is offensive. Let's talk about why, why, why is this offensive? Who is it harming? Where does it come from? How do we undo it? And so the, the, the violent uh, instincts take away all of that possible conversation, right? So La Lucha, right, would say, okay, so let's, let's get those things down and let's fight for them to come down and let's struggle for them to come down, but let's struggle to change the things that put them there in the first place. And, and that's so, uh, all of what both of you said is so rich to me. And it, it reminds me that, you know, it, there are some certain parts of this um, that sort of rub against um, certain things that we've all, always been taught about Catholic social teaching, like sort of the, the primacy on sort of a kind of um, collaboration and walking together seems to go against the idea of struggle, right? That like debate even seems to be this, you know, Marxism is one of the things that is often thrown around. This is part of the, within the, the church, I've noticed among uh, certain of our leaders, um, this idea that Marxist dialectics of like the oppressed versus the oppressor is something that we don't subscribe to in Catholic social teaching. And therefore it's not, it's not compatible with our tradition. How, how, I mean, is it going that, that next level into the explaining the why, the conversation that helps us get around that sort of, I don't know, that discursive loop or is, has that, is that helpful? I think it is helpful to the extent that a person is actually seeking clarity. I think when you have these hyperbolic um, characterizations of Catholic social teaching, the goal isn't to say, um, I'm reacting, hyper I, I'm, I'm framing Catholic social teaching in this way in order to better understand or accompany people in the journey. I'm doing these things to discredit it because it, it, it fundamentally um, puts into question my own sense of power and my existential wholeness. So I, I think that intent becomes very important. And I think that the dangerous, um, the dangerous legacy of the past five or six years in the United States is that, um, that there is a, that this culture of validating kind of every kind of perspective at the expense of a kind of a moral uh, clarity and certitude gets us into this place where um, everything's legitimate, nothing matters, everyone is righteous if they're pissed off. Like it doesn't work like that. And someone will ultimately say, well, who gets to decide? And I think I should decide because it's like, it's so, it gets so out of hand um, because the, the kind of the accusations are never about an invitation to learn more. If they were, then maybe I could um, kind of soften my stance, but I mean, it's the, the, the kind of, there's, there's kind of two frameworks that we can approach the world in. One in which our curiosity and our desire for depth is where we meet different ideas. And we say, I'm curious, I, I wanna understand this because I have a, a, de a desire for depth. And even if it isn't about agreement, but the ways that a lot of arguments are packaged, the loudest voices in the room, 
are engaged in something um, disingenuous. And it is, I will just suggest that there will always be equivalencies in order to discredit or in order to um, evade the possibility of death. And this is where I start to get very irritated um, because that has fueled the culture war around Catholic social teaching. This has fueled the culture war around anti-racism. This has fueled a culture war that is not about sitting in the, the depths of the discomfort and the struggle. It's about um, creating these false equivalencies for the purpose of keeping things very superficial and actually discouraging the type of discernment we need. And so I think that this is, um, this is these are the conversations that I can endlessly, I don't know how to stop it. I think it makes me incredibly angry and irritated because it comes from a place of not wanting to really um, use the fullness of our intellect and our spirit to really go deep. Well, you know, Marcia, you said something that I think is key. You, you talked about the loudest voices in the room. And at least in, in the sense of my own comunidad, I want us to start becoming the loudest voices in the room. Uh, we've, we have been pushed to quiet. We have been pushed to fear. We have been pushed to invisibility. So as an educator, right, for me, the, the, the best thing we can do is educate. Um, are young to be that loud voice to say, no, this is why no. And so you're, you're, you're going to go ahead and, and use all of your tropes to silence me. You're going to call me whatever you want to call me, but you don't have anything to stand on because I can counter everything that you were saying. And I saw that at play yesterday when, when uh, the House of Representatives uh, presented their, their new uh, group that's working on, on uh, economic disparity and, and economic justice. And they brought up the letter from the Catholic bishops and quoted it at their press conference. Uh, now, sadly, it's from 1986. Let's get something new. Let's get something new. But but we have the resources as, as Catholics, as Christians, we have the resources to fight back and to say, well, you, you can't say we're all made in the image of God. And at the same time, exclude all of these people who are the image of God. And we just have to keep talking it through and and when i when i see my students discover the power of catholic social teaching and the power of going back to the gospel um for giving foundations for what they want to fight for i i see them just like gain an amount of self-confidence that wasn't there before because now they can talk from a really knowledgeable place and they can also address their elders and give their elders the reasons for their own anger. Yeah, that makes so much sense. Um, here's some something that might kind of naturally flow from that. This is from a Colin Longmore question. Um, in terms of, you know, also this thing of the loudest voices in the room and who gets to express their anger. Um, Colin says that Solange, uh, the song Mad, I don't know if you've heard this song, it's a great song, um, is one of our favorite, uh, this person's favorite reflections on anger. Um, particularly on the differences between male and female anger. Uh, do you see a distinction in how righteous anger is expressed through gender? Uh, yes, um, in terms of um, whose anger is validated and understood and whose anger um, can be weaponized uh, to, to harm, there's definitely a gender component, not always, um, but most times. I think that, um, you know, the, I think the freedom to be angry is something that um, I long for deeply. Um, but as a woman, as a black woman, I do not have that. Um, and so, you know, this is a, this essentially is at the core of my existential condition. And so I think that um, it isn't just about um, gender and the expression of anger. It's the ability for that anger to be understood as, um, as valuable and important. And so I think 
um, you know, it, it's so fascinating to think about our socialization around anger. Um, I have a newborn, that's why I'm yawning. I'm, I'm present, I'm just tired all the time. <laughs> you know, I have, a, I have an infant and um, I think about the ways that I try to soothe him. He, he doesn't know what I'm saying, but the things that I'm saying, and I'm very aware of when he's agitated, when he is fussy, when he is just being a baby in this world. My go-to is calm down, it's okay, relax. And I think to myself, this may work in this relationship at this point, but this may not be the most productive way that I introduce my child in, in, into the world when he is angry or upset, right? And I think about um, the ways that um, I am also raising a black child. So I am gonna have a conversation about the expression of anger with him as much as I don't want to. And so when we put all these layers of identity on anger, it is something that we all feel and we can all, we've all grappled with, we all know that feeling. But what that knowing does in the outside world and, and how it then reshapes us internally, I think is such an important exploration. And I think explorations like that can be so deeply productive because they're both personal and structural. Um, the question remains, where are the spaces in which that conversation can, um, can emerge and can actually you know, kind of heal us and transform us? And again, if these conversations aren't happening in places of faith where we talk about death and dying and the meaning of life, then that says something so powerful about our aversion to anger. Yeah, well, you know, as a Latina, anger is not a thing I'm supposed to ever express. Yet, um, we do we do it in other ways. Uh, and, 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 you know, some of our dances, for instance, I think, um, in, in our different uh, communities uh, show a lot of resistance and, and anger in them. But um, I, I want to look at the, at the word that comes before anger in, in our conversation here, are righteous, right? And, and righteousness is also something we don't really talk about uh, because, again, that, that's a concept that, that's not really ours. And, and it's so clear, even, even it, during the liturgy, you know, when English language uh, uh, people are saying it is right and just, we are saying es justo y necesario. And I, I love that idea that what is right is what is necessary. What is right is what's necessary for life. That, that that's how we know what is right. You know, in, 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 in the last uh, week, um, my, my friends uh, Arturo and, and Nancy talked about the role of beauty. And for me, beauty discloses a lot by its presence but even more by its absence. And when, when we want to be able to discern what should make us really full of this necessary <laughs> uh, anger for what is necessary, it's when we notice the lack of beauty in something. And, and that's hard to debate. It's really hard to debate uh, that something is inherently awful, ugly, terrible. Um, and, and, and if we get people to that point where they can see the awfulness of something, right? So for me, like I, I look at the environment and, 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 you know, we look at the great garbage patch, nothing less beautiful than that. It, it, it's, so it should make it necessary for us to act against it, right? And so beauty can have that powerful, uh, a discerning role of telling us this is wrong. <laughs> this does not come from God. This has to be stopped. And you are called to do all you can to stop it. And so, yeah, I'm going to be a Latina who is in La Lucha and I'm going to be loud <laughs> and I'm going to fight back because I'm doing it because the beauty is missing. As a uh, as a critic of the arts, who is often often uh, tying the morality of things to their rigor or lack or of beauty or whatever, I I, I totally endorse this. I, I love that formulation. Um, and, and 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 so if we think of beauty as one sort of, in some ways, it's like a, a clarifier, right? Or a, um, 
it, it, a way, as you say, that, that this is unarguable. Um, the next question is really interesting about the sort of the, the place of persuasion in all of this. The, um, Rebecca says, I live in an area where conservative evangelicalism is the predominant religion. And I would just say as a sidebar, it, you don't have to be an, a conservative evangelical to display some of the things that we're talking about. But um, many people in that camp claim to be discerning God's will and embodying God's righteous anger in their actions, right? So it's this kind of issue of side versus side, like you were talking about, Marcia. Um, how might they be led to the kind of discernment that you mentioned? So Cecilia offers beauty as one of these, this is maybe perhaps one of these things that can do this, this work of leading or persuasion. Um, I guess I would ask, what are those things? And also more broadly, what is the role of persuasion here? Is there a point at which we say, we're in, the, we're in La Lucha together and for, you know, the time for persuasion is over. That's a thing that I think about a lot and worry about a lot as a writer who I think persuasion is one of my aims, but I can't always be sure. Oh, I love that question um, because I think that this is something that's probably one of my greatest failures is to hang in and persuade. I mean, I think I think there's a lot of ways we can think about this. There's the, there's the opportunity to kind of model and bear witness, right? That may not be as um, loud, but is clear. Um, but I think there's also, you know, I think about invitations often, and I think it's because I'm um, a professor, and I think everything I do with my students is an invitation to, to meet my intellectual curiosity, and they are inviting me to understand, you know, their own intellectual interests, and we, we can do this together. And so when we think about, you know, when we're in a context in which people's anger drive them to do things that are counter to the things that our anger are driving us to. I think, the, I think what's at the heart of this is, um, what is the invitation you are issuing and what is the invitation they are issuing and ask them in that way. Um, if I were to join you in this, is my world gonna become bigger or smaller? Am I gonna be more afraid or less afraid? Am I going to feel freer or am I gonna be constrained by, the, constrained by the need to consolidate my own power? I think that political rhetoric um, is really hard to like fight against because people believe what they believe. But the fundamental question of what do you desire the most and what extent are you gonna to go to get it is a place in which I think people can actually meet quite productively. Um, when I was talking a lot about Ferguson syllabus and trying to really encourage people to think about the many um, the revelatory possibilities of what happened in Ferguson. Um, I would often, you know, people would have these huge debates about policing and violence and who's at fault and all these things. And all I could return to um, in, a, in a deeply spiritual sense is the it, Christianity is predicated on the idea of return. This is the whole point that what is once lost will be returned to us. That's all we got. I mean, we've got some other stuff, but that's what we have, right? The possibility and the hopefulness of return. And so if we distill it and we say, what would you do so that someone can return to you if they leave your home? And what does it mean for someone to leave and never return because of state violence, because of race, because of these things? What would you be willing to do to like end that for all people? This I found a more productive and healthier place in which people to engage than to suggest all of the structural inequalities that they couldn't get or understand. And so I, I think at the end of the day, that, that question is one of distillation and invitation. And I think we're only able to do that when we do deeply kind of spiritually and existentially rigorous work to understand what we can invite people to do with us and what, when we distill ourselves and our desires to its most kind of basic places, what are the desires of our heart are and how do we invite other people into that? That's the most helpful opportunity. Well, and also as a professor and somebody who works with our young, I there are people that are unpersuadable and I'm not so worried about them. I'm worried about our young. They care about the right things. Their instincts are good, but they don't know they, they, they don't have a sense that God is on their side. And so for me, part, a big part of what I want to do is I want them to have the tools 
from the Christian tradition to see that God's on their side, to see that the, the lies that are perpetuated out, out there are not what Christianity is, and to welcome them in as co-workers in the vineyard uh, to do the work of, of building the reign of God, el reino. Um, it's exciting and beautiful work. And, and so the others may not be persuaded, but at, but at least if you are a young person who really cares about these things, know that your, your tradition has all of the tools within it to help you to be more effective, to have the fire within you, to keep going, to have that resilience for La Lucha, for Si Se Puede. You know, Cesar Chavez marched behind the banner of Our Lady of Guadalupe, right? Um, and, and so me, to me, that, that's my concern, that we don't keep Catholic social teaching a secret and that we allow the subversive power of the gospel to really speak out. Right. Um, that's a wonderful, that uh, this idea of inviting the young seems to me to be so, I mean, I think, and hopefully part of the, the space that we're making in these conversations is for, um, is precisely for them as well to sort of um, have a space to have their angers, their hopes, their fears sort of um, validated and be, as Marsha mentioned, um, invited into a larger um, community. On that note, I would just love to um, offer the opportunity for if anybody has has a wait a closing thought or anything like that before we before we end we've got three more minutes so there's a sort of encapsulating thought that has, this all has brought up for you I'd love to hear before we before we close out. The last thing I will say about anger and this is a this is a bit of wisdom that my husband has said to me and I think about it often. Um, our capacity to sit with the discomfort of others helps strengthen our capacity to sit with the, within the discomfort of our own self. And I think that this is probably one of the most powerful ways in which we can um, know how to position ourselves in relationship to righteous anger. That it is the discomfort of others. It is the um, the... The, the discord that we, we experience when we, when we kind of react to people, that our ability to kind of sit with that and our ability to be in solidarity with those who suffer and to really, really understand the power of that, to understand the power of, of being with those who are angry will allow us to mediate the negative feelings that we feel when we are angry. And so, um, you know, I, I understand the impulse to just kind of a scurry way and bury your head in the sand when someone is expressing their anger. But our ability to withstand that, to sit with it, allows us to do more, um, I think, in terms of actually moving that anger to a place of, of productive action. Yeah, and I would echo that uh, and, and say, be attentive to the absence of beauty. Just pay attention. It's a great pointer. And then once you see it, be in solidarity, as Marcia said, be in solidarity for those and with those for whom beauty is being denied. And, and I think if we can do that, then we, we'll get someplace that starts to resemble the reign of God. That's wonderful and a wonderful place to end. I want to thank both of you, Marcia and Cecilia, has been just an honor for me to, to be with you for, for this hour. Um, and thanks also to all of our uh, participants. We've had um, lovely sort of engagement in the Q&A and in the chat um, and Commonweal, of course. Thank you all for, uh, for participating and Commonweal for setting this up. Uh, it's been a wonderful way to spend the afternoon. Thank you so much.